here today. That's my first uh, NSC. So my name is Guillaume Baladon, and today we do the speech with uh, Nicolas Vivet here, who is the second part. And we are both uh, working at ANSI, which is uh, the French uh, national agency for the security of information systems. And today we want to uh, talk about what we call DGP hijacks and the way uh, we can detect them. So first, uh, let's start with a recent example. So last August, uh, researchers from Dell they reported that someone, an attacker, managed to steal uh, $83,000 uh, worth of videos. So it's a bit surprising because this attack was possible thanks to BGP and BGP hijacks. So the attacker indeed uh, take advantage of the fact that there is no authentication between miners, which are the, the tools, uh, software doing the computation for bitcoins, or litecoins, or this kind of uh, currency. No authentication between miners and the pool. The pool that's the actual software taking computations from the miners and putting that into your BGP, not BGP, but your Bitcoin wallet. And by using BGP prefix hijacks, the attacker was uh, able to pretend to be uh, the pool. And because he was pretending the pool, he managed to reconfigure the miners in order to, uh, to steal money. So I think that's a really good example to start the presentation because it shows that by using prefix, uh, BGP prefix hijack, um, Thank you, and that's good. People can see money. So first, uh, we talk about a bit BGP. Uh, what is BGP? It stands for Border Gateway Protocol. So maybe you don't know, but that's the only routing protocol used on the internet. Uh, it runs on top of TCP over a dedicated uh, interconnection between operators. Could be a fiber, could be a copper cable. And the main goal of BGP is to inform the world uh, that an operator is in charge of IP prefixes. And uh, the second goal of BGP is to interconnect all of the internet operators. So here, you can see a really simple example where we are trying to interconnect Orange, French ISP, to SoftBank, a Japanese ISP. And of course, there is no such cable in between France and Japan. So Orange and SoftBank, they are indeed interconnected uh, using another uh, provider. In this case, it's uh, Hurricane Electric. And, because of, and thanks to Hurricane Electric, Orange is able to exchange packets with uh, SoftBank. So it's a really simplified view of the internet, but just show that if you are not able to directly connect to an operator, you can go see an operator, in this case, Recon Electric, in order to get uh, full connectivity. So what do you need, do you need uh, to play and use BGP? So first, uh, you need a network. So it could be anything, could be a laptop, could be a, a lot of servers. You also need uh, what we call an autonomous system number, AS number. And indeed, a just a unique identifier of your network on the internet. Um, so, for example, Orange, French ISP, is not Orange anymore, that's autonomous system number 3215. Uh, you will also need an IP prefix, so in this case, we have a big one, slash 16. Of course, you need a BGP router, could be anything, could be a big and really expensive networking equipment from people like uh, Cisco, or could be uh, my laptop with a software such as OpenBGP or Bird. And finally, we need a BGP interconnection. So BGP interconnection is a bit like an uh, IP connectivity you get at home, except that instead of using your um, set-top box, you will use a uh, BGP router. So in this case, because uh, uh, this example um, shows a really small operator, the small operator is asking BGP connectivity to someone we call a, an autonomous system tra uh, transit provider, which is, it could be like, um, in your mind, it could be a big ISP for smaller ones. And because of this transit provider, the IS42 in this example is, in, is able to get connectivity and exchange packets over the internet. So if you want to start your operator, you will need some uh, internet resources allocation and autonomous system numbers and uh, IP prefixes uh, allocated by people called uh, Regional Internet Registry. So if you're in Europe, you can go to RIPE, uh, they are based in, uh, in Amsterdam. If you're, for example, in Asia, you can go to APNIC and ask for these uh, internet resources. So in Europe, per year, it will cost you 50 euros for an autonomous system number and the same price for a slash 22 prefix. That's a bit more than uh, 1,000 IP addresses. So something that you might already know, you can access these internet resources by using the risk protocol. So that's a really simple example here on the screen. We are trying to retrieve information uh, related to autonomous system 4713. So we can see here that uh, yeah, this autonomous system, uh, that's entity, Japanese operator is mainly located in Japan, and the country attribute. And also here, you can see that we can retrieve uh, technical and administrative content. So if you prefer using a web browser, you can access the same kind of information by using this website. 
that's more useful because it's nicer. And also, you, you get the same information like the name. You get also, on top of the name and uh, the administrative and technical context, you can get the IP prefixes sorry, used by this autonomous system. So let's, let's go back to BGP. Sorry, I need to go. So BGP is a bit complicated. You have a lot of messages. But today, we'll only discuss two because they are really important. First one, we, have, we call them update messages. And they are used to announce that uh, an operator is in charge of IP prefixes. So here we have three operators. So orange, this is, for example, that's the one in the bottom. And both of them are announcing uh, one IP prefix. And by announcing one IP prefix, an operator says, OK, I'm willing to receive traffic. And the other uh, message is called wish door message. And the goal is to remove IP prefixes from the internet. So here, um, on the left, that's uh, YouTube. So because YouTube is sending this uh, wish door message, you won't be able to see uh, catch videos anymore uh, on the YouTube website. So that's a really uh, silly example. So BGP, again, that's complicated, both in the, in the specification and also in the way uh, you need to operate BGP. So today, with Nicolas, we decided to only discuss really simple BGP rules. So the first one uh, is uh, the following. The first BGP rule says that messages are forwarded to neighbors after adding the autonomous system. So here, S number one sends an update message, and S2 uh, receives this message, processes it, and the routing table in green is the following. It says that in order to reach IPs in the slash 24 prefix, packet will be sent to S number one. That's really easy. And because of this rule, when S number two will forward the update message, the routing table of S3 will be the following. It says that in order to reach IP, IP addresses in the slash 24 prefix, packets will be sent to S2, then to S1. That's really, really simple. So second rule, it says that the only, only the short IS pass is forwarded. So an IS pass is indeed the list of an autonomous system you must send your packet to. So here we have two paths to S1 on the left. One is short, one is longer. And because of uh, rule number two, the routers in IS2 will select the short pass and forward that to IS4. So we can see that from the S4 point of view, packets will be sent to S2, then to S1. That's, again, really simple rule. And the last rule is indeed uh, related to IP routing, not really related to BGP. So here for, let's say, uh, network uh, engineering, uh, S number one is sending two uh, IP prefixes to the internet, one on top slash 16, and one in the bottom slash 24. So the uh, routing table of S2 is the following. We have two entries, one for small prefix, slash 24, one for bigger prefix, slash 16. And because of rule number three, if someone wants to send a packet to IP address 192.0.2.42, the packets will be sent to S number three. That's, again, really easy. But that's really useful in order to explain what are BGP hijacks and how we can fight them. So hijacks. Indeed, hijacks are really simple. They are just conflicting uh, BGP update messages. So here, S number zero, is announcing a slash 23 prefix. And at the same time, the bad guy is doing the same announcement. So we have two entries in the routing table of IS2. One is short, one is longer. And because of BGP rule number two, the traffic will be redirected to S3. So that's a BGP hijack. We have some kind of conflicting uh, entries in a routing table. So what can operators do to fight uh, BGP hijacks? The first thing they can do is they can announce what we call uh, more specific prefixes. So here, uh, S number zero, in order to get back his traffic, he will uh, announce two slash 24 prefixes. So you don't need to do the computation in your mind, but these two slash 24 prefixes are both included in the slash 23 prefix. So the routing table of S2 is the following. We have four entries, and because of rule number three, the router in uh, S2 will select the more, speci more specific prefixes, and S0 will get back its traffic. That's, again, really simple um, behavior. And this is indeed really used by, uh, by uh, operators. So last October, indeed October 16, one French operator, so OVH, I think the French people uh, know, know these guys, they announced on Twitter that they were actually being hijacked. And a few minutes later, on this tweet here, in the bottom, they say, OK, we have announced the slash 24 and it should be fixed. So they were hijacked, and they announced a more specific prefix in order to get uh, their traffic back. 
So indeed, it's not that good. It could be weird if you are not into BGP and not into networking to say, okay, if we are under attack, we need to fight back by announcing more, spe uh, more specific prefixes. That's a bit silly. But indeed, at least in Europe, it's quite common that operators filter on BGP interconnection. And a BGP filter is a bit like a firewall. It will drop some specific packets. So in this example, we can say that AS number three is not allowed to send uh, and to announce the slash 23 prefix. So the packet will be dropped. So that's a way to filter uh, BGP prefix by using uh, uh, filters. However, you need to keep in mind that some operators don't apply filters. So that's why we're able to see uh, and detect uh, BGP hijacks on the internet. So be because maintaining uh, this kind of filter could be uh, a bit difficult, <coughs> and also because the internet is uh, moving and changing a lot, uh, uh, what we use as internet operator, we, we use something we call route objects. Route objects, indeed, are declared in the WIS database, and they are declared by the autonomous system or the operator in charge of an IP prefix. And a route object is really simple. It will tell who can announce the prefix in BGP. It could be the operator itself. could be its DDoS mitigation provider. It could be its client. So here, this example, again, uh, we are using the WIS uh, command. We are trying to retrieve the route objects associated, associated sorry, with the slash 22, which is our prefix, and we can see that the slash 22 prefix will indeed be announced on BGP by our autonomous system, which is the number uh, 202 uh, Okay, so that's all you need to know about uh, BGP and Ajax, and the main part of the talk indeed is related to how we can detect uh, this, uh, this Ajax. And first, I will try uh, to explain what we, we do concerning offline Ajax detection. Sorry. I think that is a social event and the beer need to drink water today. So, what we want to do, we need to want to take BGP messages as received by uh, networking equipment, like uh, in this case a Cisco router, and we want to be able to display them in a web browser because we are lazy, it's a good way to do a graphical interface. So, first thing we need to have, we need to have a really nice view of the internet, and to do so, indeed, we need to connect to a lot of people on the internet. And we are not a big operator, so what we do, we are using data from the routing information service. Um, it is provided by the right people, same guy from the WIS database. And these guys, they put 13 BGP routers all over the world. And we call them BGP collectors because um, these routers, they receive updates and uh, regional message, and they put that into binary file. So each year, uh, the routing information service generates close to 550 gigabytes of data. And we need to look for hijacks in, the, in this data. It's kind of big. So the first thing we need to do, because we have binary messages, is parse them. So we decided to do our own uh, BGP parser. First off, why? Because it's kind of fun to do uh, your own parser. You always uh, learn new things. Mm -hmm. And also we wanted a fast and trust trusted parser. And the main goal of the parser is to take the BGP messages in binary and display them in JSON. So here we have two update messages in JSON. Um, they both announce the same slash 24 prefix in red. However, in blue, you can see that the autonomous system at the origin, they are different. So it means that manually and with our eyes, we manage to detect a BGP conflict. It could be an hijack, or it could be uh, indeed uh, a regular uh, BGP announcement. Because it, it could be too slow to process all of the packets this way, we need to emulate a BGP router. And the main uh, idea of the emulation is to build something like this tree, that's a routing table. Um, for example, here we have four entries in the routing table. It's really small. Today on the internet, we have close to um, uh, 500,000 prefixes in a router. So of course, this, uh, this uh, figure is, uh, is a bit uh, small. However, in this example, we can see that this uh, slash 10 prefix here is announced at the same time as IS4 and IS5. So to implement that, we use Python and a py, uh, Python module called uh, Python Radix, which is implemented in C. It's quite fast. It's uh, quite similar to what you will find in a router or in a liner scanner. And what we do, we are trying to update a tree with each update and visual message we see. So here, we will try to process uh, an update message together. <laughs> so we'll do a lookup in the, in the routing table, and we'll see that the slash 24 uh, prefix here in blue is indeed including the slash 22 uh, prefix here. We learned before that the slash 22 prefix is indeed announced by uh, autonomous system number 42. However, here in this example, the update message was sent by autonomous system 666, which means that we managed to detect a conflict. 
That's the basics of uh, BGP uh, hijack detection. So if we put everything together, we have raw uh, and binary BGP messages. We have the BGP parser. Then in order to be fast, we emulate several BGP routers. And at the end, we input uh, the contents as a JSON. And if you want to process the whole internet, so today on the internet, we have uh, close to 50,000 autonomous systems. Indeed, we use a lot of cores, which is a, a usual way to scale. And a month of data takes uh, close to 10 hours on my laptop to process. However, if you will recall what I said before, we are, we, are, sorry, we are using 13 different BGP collectors, which means that we need to process uh, 156 months per year. Indeed, that would be a way too slow to just stay with this system. So what we did next, we scaled by uh, adding cores. Again, that's a bit usual uh, when you want to make your computation faster. So with um, five servers, we're able to process one week of data. Uh, sorry, one year of data in a little bit less than one week, which is kind of cool. That's fast enough. However, um, this number is a bit too big for us. So from January um, 2014 to October 2014, <coughs> the system detected uh, more than 11 billion conflicts. And again, most of these stuff are not hijacked. So we need to be smart um, in the way we will detect uh, GP hijacks. <coughs> So the conflict example, we have the timestamp, we have the name of the collector, the BGP router, which received uh, the message, and we see that there is a conflict because the, slash uh, the two slash 24 prefixes, they were um, uh, sent by two different system systems in blue. So that's a lot of data. So what we did in order to uh, access the data faster, we use Disco. So if you know uh, MapReduce, and if you do Hadoop, uh, Disco is a bit like uh, uh, <coughs> the Map and Reduce framework. And the main goal of this stuff is to automatically uh, replicate and distribute the data among uh, some servers in order to make the access time faster and the computation faster. So we use Disco uh, to try to isolate um, conflicts that are targeting, for example, France, or in the, the last part of this presentation, um, that are target, targeting Japan. So it's a bit like going from big data, that's a big buzzword, but indeed that's not convenient. Uh, so we go from big data to small data to something we can actually process on the laptop. So with Disco, we are able to extract a conflict targeting 1,000 autonomous system, which is close to the number of autonomous systems in France and in Japan in one hour. So it's kind of fast. So at the end, we need to look for um, conflicts. So we need to look for BGP adjacks into 70 million conflicts per country, so for France and Japan. So that's still a lot. Yes, I can do that on my laptop. So, what can we do? We can try to classify conflicts, and the first thing we can do, we can use rot objects. So if you recall what I said before, rot objects, they are used to say which autonomous system will actually do uh, the BGP uh, update, send the BGP update message. So we can try uh, to do that. So we, here we have a conflict, and we'll use a with a common line to say, okay, please tell me which autonomous system is allowed to announce the slash 24 prefix. And here we can see that autonomous system 666 is indeed allowed thanks of the rot object to do the end announcement. So this conflict is not an object. However, we need to validate 70 million conflicts, and we need to check all of them every day. And online queries will be way too slow. So it could be OK, for example, if I'm querying the RIPE database in between Paris and uh, Amsterdam, because the uh, RIPE servers are located in Amsterdam. However, if I want to query the database of uh, GPNIC, uh, the Japanese one located in Tokyo, it will be way too slow to as for 70 million uh, queries. So what we did, we uh, downloaded every day the WIS databases from APNIC, IRIN, and RIPE. We maintain a local copy, and we do the lookups. So by using a raw object, we are able to remove 30, 32 sorry, uh, of the conflicts regarding France, and only few regarding uh, Japan. So it's a really interesting for us, because it means that, uh, because there's a big difference in these numbers, the best practices, the best uh, network practices are not the same in Europe, in Japan. That's a really, really interesting fact for us because we are trying to understand how the internet works. Second thing we can do is use a WIS database in order to check if we can find a relation between two autonomous systems. So here, there is a conflict between uh, the autonomous system on the left, which is SFR, uh, that the French people know, that's a big French ISP, and a smaller one, Moselle Telecom, which is a 
uh, Moselle is a small part of France, but they have their own <laughs> autonomous system. And indeed, we detect, detected a conflict between these two autonomous systems. So by using the WIS database, we're able to see that they share the same administrative contact and the same technical contact. So indeed, these two autonomous systems are not uh, in conflict. Uh, Moselle Telecom is indeed a client of SFR. And people at SFR, maybe they forgot to do the road object declaration. So in France, it works fine. 54% of the conflict could be removed. That's a big win for us. In Japan, only 2% could be removed. So again, um, that was expected because we know that the Europe, um, <coughs> European database, the one from RIPE, uh, is uh, more complete than the one in, uh, in Japan or in the US. Last thing we try to do is to use the client provider connectivity between two autonomous systems. So here, that's a simple example. We can say that uh, this of the autonomous system pass says that an uh, autonomous system 666, which is sending the conflicting updates, is indeed connected to IS-1000. So if this update message was an hijack, it, wa it will be possible for IS-1000 to just put a filter and drop um, the announcement. So again, that's a good way to say that uh, these conflicts uh, are not hijacked. In France and Japan, we can remove close to 5% of the conflicts. So it's not that bad. So if we put everything together, we have the following next level. Um, and this works fine for France because at the end we need to look for our VGP hijacks into 8 million what we call abnormal conflicts. And for Japan it's not that good. We still have 42 million uh, conflicts to, to, to check. <coughs> so the next thing uh, we do, is, again that's really usual. We have uh, a lot of small messages, update messages, that's the blue dots here. So blue means the two autonomous systems are related. And we have a lot of green update messages. Green means the update messages were validated, validated ring what object. And finally, red means um, it's maybe a sub it's a likely an, uh, an IJF. So before aggregation in this example, again, that's a really simple example, we have two conflicts. And at the end, we only have one, something we call events, with a begin date and an end date. So before we had many updates in conflicts, and at the end, we have uh, the same number for France and Japan, which is uh, 75,000 events. And again, most of them are not uh, BGP hijacks. So step by step and really slowly, we are able to uh, detect them. So let's have a look at something more useful. So here, that's a visualization uh, that's done with uh, D3, uh, which is a JavaScript uh, framework. That's a screenshot from uh, one of our tools. And here, we are looking at <coughs> events targeting uh, the new system from uh, oops, sorry, January to October. And each line, that there are indeed uh, prefixes in conflict. And here, with this nice visualization, we are able to see many really useful information. For, for example, here, we have some kind of strange line in March. And we can see that some events they go from red to green, which means that someone, this big ISP, they did the raw object declaration. And also, which is cool, it means that before March, all of this red stuff, they are not BGP hijacks. They are really good. Also, here. And those, those, did you see? Yeah. Here we have a really long red <coughs> event that starts in January and ends in October. Again, because it's really long, it's likely not to be an hijack because the operator didn't do anything to uh, fight it. And finally, if we have a look at this red line, you can see red and blue and red and blue. It means that um, the event is a changing category over time. And for example, it will be uh, really useful for, that, for us because we, we can remove this event. Going from red to blue means Sometimes we there's a suspicious event, and from some other time, this event is indeed in the relation category. So the autonomous systems are, are related, are connected. So by using these simple rules, we are putting all of the events in MongoDB, and we are applying some filters. First, we remove events that change categories over time, for uh, let's say uh, red to green. Finally, we remove events uh, that be, that uh, that belong to the same country. So it's a bit silly this rule, but the main goal is to say that if there is an hijack or a conflict between two French operators, if they want to fight, they can go to court and just fight and make it stop. So that's why we remove that. We also remove events longer than six months because, again, the operator didn't do anything to fight, uh, fight them. So from, for France and Japan, we have kind of nice, interesting results. So at the end of the filtering, we just need to look uh, for hijacks into, um, for France, uh, close to 300 uh, uh, 
events in Japan uh, close to 600 events. And unfortunately for us, that's as far as we can go for the automatic uh, filtering. So we need to look at the data, it takes time, uh, and that's one of the visualizations that we use to look at the data. So here it's misleading, it's not IJAX targeting Japan, that's indeed events targeting Japan. And I need to do the manual classification by myself to say if it's an IJAX or not. So the table is simple, we have the origin autonomous system, so the guy which is usually doing the VGP announcements. We have the hijacker, or likely to be an hijacker autonomous system, we have the prefix in conflicts, the duration, and many useful information. So it takes time. So what we do, we put the data into IPython, because it's really nice and easy to do some uh, HTML widgets with uh, checkboxes and say, okay, that's an ajax, it's not an ajax. <coughs> and by doing the analysis manually, we have inter interesting results. For example, in Japan, there was some <coughs> autonomous system in conflicts, and one of them was called uh, PacNet Malaysia, and the other one was called PacNet Global. Indeed, both of these two autonomous systems, they belong to one bigger, bigger company called the Pacific Network. So it's not an agent, but it's kind of difficult to automate this detection. One good stuff, we managed to see that uh, some Japanese operators were indeed under DDoS protection, I think it was banks, and the DDoS mitigation company, in order to get the traffic of the banks, they were announcing a slash 24 profit. So it was a conflict, but indeed, uh, it was for good. We also, from time to time, we have typos in nice number, so some guy in the autonomous system 2208, in the BGP router, uh, they forgot one, two. So we have like conflicting uh, BGP uh, update messages. And that's, again, impossible to automate. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, generate a lot of uh, false negative. Finally, good stuff for us. Uh, we managed to detect the hijacks that were used to steal bitcoins. And this was, uh, they were sent by autonomous system number uh, eight, uh, 18 was at the origin of these hijacks. And finally, because we are working at, uh, at ANSI, we are talking with operators in order to make reports, and where they are able to detect some events that were never detected by operators. It's kind of cool for us, because we can go and talk to our operators in order to say, okay, guys, there is some hijacks. What did you do? Did you see them or not? And can we work together to uh, make uh, the internet better? So I will conclude on the of app detection. So since January 2014, there are uh, close uh, to 100 suspicious events. Indeed, some of them, they might be hijacked. And we are, we are doing the same kind of observation since uh, 2011. And since 2011, <coughs> there are around 10 hijacks uh, per year that are tagging French operators. So indeed, what we need to do next is to go to <coughs> French operators, talk with them, and, and check if these uh, suspicious events are hijacked or not. And Nicolas, indeed, will go a little bit further and show you how we can be smarter than the offline detection in order to reduce the number of events that we can classify as uh, hijacked or not. Okay, so um, you've seen previously with uh, Leo that uh, it was possible to, uh, to steal money uh, or actually bitcoins using BGP hijacks, but uh, there is something more, uh, because the researchers from uh, Renesis, uh, they were able to discover last year that BGP hijacks were also used to steal traffic, but to steal traffic covertly. That is to say that um, if you are a user, you cannot uh, see that your traffic is being redirected. And um, the Renesis guys, they were able to find out that um, this redirection was uh, happening because they are running trust routes um, inside the net network, the networks, uh, and they were able to find that, for example, the traffic initially located inside the US uh, were being redirected through Eastern Europe uh, and sent back to the US. So this is pretty bad because um, as a user, you cannot protect uh, yourself against this kind of attack, but the only thing you can do is secure your communications by adding uh, encryption or authentication. Uh, but it's also pretty bad because uh, the network operators, they were not able to find out about this attack. Uh, and that's really this uh, that, uh, that discovered it. So this is um, something that uh, uh, with BGP hijacks, uh, we, we want to, to be able to detect also this kind of attacks. And we, we ask ourselves, uh, can we do it with the tools uh, we developed for offline detection? 
and uh, are we able to, uh, to uh, also ourselves uh, launch active measurements uh, in order to, to, to detect this kind of, uh, of, de of uh, redirection. And in fact, this is what uh, we did. Um, we took uh, the tools that we developed for uh, offline uh, BGP uh, hijack detection, mm -hmm. and um, we made it work for uh, real-time detection. Um, and we wanted to do that to get a report as soon as there were um, BGP hijack happening, but also for um, for uh, launching active measurements uh, in order to gather more information about uh, uh, where goes the traffic. And we did that, but uh, first uh, we needed to uh, automate quite a lot of uh, process that we were doing manually. And for example, uh, we needed to um, to fetch quite a lot of data. Uh, as you've seen with, with Guillaume, it's like uh, 500 uh, gigabytes uh, for a year. And uh, we must, um, in order to detect the BGP hijacks in real time, we must fetch this data as soon as they are available. And first, we did that by um, uh, taking all the command lines that we were uh, executing in order to, to fetch the data, and we put them in a cron tab. But uh, trust me, it fails sometimes, and um, all, all your uh, pro detection process uh, is, uh, is screwed up. So we decided to use a, a tool called Luigi, and you can uh, think of, uh, as Luigi as a, a more powerful cron tab uh, with a retry on error and, uh, and uh, task de dependencies, which is pretty cool because um, as soon as uh, our uh, fetching jobs were, were done, we needed to, um, to process the data. Uh, for example, for the internet registries that we are fetching every day, um, we, uh, we had to, to, to insert the data in the WIS databases. And so we did that with, with Luigi, uh, which is actually developed by Spotify. And uh, it's pretty cool because it saved us quite a lot of time to, uh, to automate all the, the detection process. And so, once we, we got all this working and uh, we had the data available, we were able to, to launch our um, uh, the BGP hijack detection process in real time uh, and get a report as soon as uh, we were detecting a, a BGP hijack. Um, actually, we only get um, a report for uh, suspicious BGP hijacks. Uh, we don't care about um, uh, uh, conflicting announcements uh, that uh, went um, uh, classified by the, uh, by the root object, etc. And we get about uh, 50 events uh, per, week, per week. And we get uh, reported by IRC, actually, because um, we could have developed a, a beautiful web interface and, and stuff, but um, um, I'm not good at it. And uh, I, I would rather have a, an IRC but uh, tell me when there is something happening. And, uh, and I think it's pretty cool. Uh, for example, here, yeah, uh, uh, we got um, a report of uh, a BGP attack, which was happening on, a, on an IPv6 prefix. And when we have this kind of information, um, as, uh, as Guillaume told you before, we want to, to gather more information about it. We want to know if it's a, a real hijack or not. And so um, we try to, to gather more information about this prefix. First, by um, uh, querying the internet registries about um, who is the owner of this prefix. Because we want to know who is the legitimate autonomous system that can announce this prefix. And here, we see that uh, for this prefix, huh, we know it's a, a Ukrainian operator, uh, which is uh, the, the owner of the prefix, uh, which was actually uh, announced uh, by a French operator, etc but also by the Ukrainian uh, operator. So uh, using uh, this, uh, uh, the WIS database, we try to, to find which one is uh, the legitimate uh, origin. But here, we still cannot, uh, there is no reference of the Ukrainian uh, autonomous system in the, in the uh, WIS database. So uh, we still don't know uh, if uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, the Ukrainian operator is uh, the legitimate uh, origin or not. But there is a, a cool um, feature uh, in the WIS tool uh, which uh, uh, allows us to ask for all the objects that belong to the same organization, or actually which shares the, the, which shares the, the same attributes. And here, we ask for all the objects that belong to this uh, 
organization, and we are able to find that the, the Ukrainian uh, operator is the legitimate origin of this prefix. So here, uh, we can almost say that it's, uh, it's a false positive um, hijack, because uh, we are able to say that the Ukrainian operator is legitimate. And in fact, when we look uh, a bit more at the information uh, we can uh, uh, get from the, the WIS database, actually the French operator made a mistake in its BGP configuration and he wanted to announce quite the same prefix, uh, but not here, there is an additional, uh, there is a missing zero, and so um, it announces a, 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 a very different prefix. Uh, uh, because uh, in IPv6 there are totally different prefixes. And so it created uh, an hijack uh, that was uh, originally quite suspicious, uh, but actually no, it's a false positive. And uh, we were able to, uh, to, uh, to, to say that for sure because uh, a few days later the Ukrainian operator created uh, the root object uh, uh, which tells uh, the world that uh, he is the legitimate uh, origin of this prefix. So this is pretty interesting because um, it shows that the classification process is very hard to automate huh? and we always uh, depend on manual analysis. But sometimes we also get malicious BGP agents, like uh, this one uh, which happened actually uh, a few weeks ago uh, targeting an IPv4 prefix uh, which is uh, normally uh, usually announced by AlphaLink which is uh, uh, the legitimate um, origin of this uh, uh, prefix because uh, uh, here I, I put it in green, uh, actually the rest, but put it in green because it was a legitimate uh, origin and it was hijacked by Teno Group which is a Romanian operator and we know it's, um, we know it's a, a real hijack because when we look at the history of the announcement of this uh, uh, Romanian operator we see that um, he has quite a strange BGP, BGP behavior because it announces quite a lot of uh, IP prefixes uh, but in a way that um, it changes its IP, uh, IP prefixes quite often and this is a typical behavior of spammers on the internet because uh, they do that in order to uh, send spam with fresh IP addresses that are not yet uh, blacklisted and so that they can bypass the, the filters and send their spam uh, uh, without a problem. And so here, yeah, we know for sure that uh, the prefix was, uh, was hijacked uh, uh, and, uh, and we were able to, to detect it. So this is quite interesting because um, we get notified as soon as uh, this was occurring and we were able to, uh, to understand that it was uh, 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 indeed a, a, a very uh, a malicious hijack. But there is something uh, else that we want to, to understand. It's that uh, what are the um, autonomous systems that accepted this uh, malicious BGP uh, update? And um, what are the ASCs that we call uh, infected ASCs? Uh, because uh, when uh, an AS, uh, an autonomous system, sorry, is, uh, is infected, all the traffic that it is sending to this, um, to this IP prefix it's, uh, it might go to, to Romania instead of France. So we want to, uh, to know what, uh, wh where is going the, the traffic. And in order to do that, uh, uh, we, uh, we must uh, launch active measurement from inside this, uh, this autonomous systems. Because by launching trust routes uh, from inside this AS, we, are, uh, we might be able to know where goes the traffic when uh, an AS uh, accept uh, an hijacking announcement. But we cannot do it easily because uh, we don't own a network and um, we, we, we cannot launch trust routes uh, uh, from inside this, uh, this AS. But we tried to use this project, uh, the Rive Atlas project, uh, which is um, a large network of probes uh, hosted by the community. And uh, when you host uh, one of these probes, uh, you can launch trust routes and uh, launch active measurements from other probes. So this is quite interesting for us because um, we might be able to use uh, this network in order to launch trust routes 
from infective ISs. And so this is what we, we, we try to do. And what's more interesting is that they also provide a public API, so we can link it to, uh, we can implement it in our, our tools in order to launch active measurements as soon as we detect the BGP hijack. So, so this is very cool. And what's also pretty cool is that the, um, the network is quite spread. So uh, we have more chance uh, of uh, having a, a probe inside an infected AS. But we also were able to, to prove that um, for all the possible hijacks that got detected from uh, during the, the experiment, uh, from September until uh, the beginning of uh, November, we always found a probe inside the infected ASs, inside the affected network. So it means that we were able to uh, to know if the traffic was going to uh, the, the malicious origin or not. Um, this diagram shows that, for example, um, about 20% of the hijack, we uh, found um, about nine probes. So it provides a, we, we, we can get a, a good view of where is going the traffic. So if I get back to, um, to my example, my previous uh, uh, malicious BGP hijack, um, the first thing uh, the, um, the tools are, are doing is try to find a probe inside this ASCs. And in fact, <coughs> when it does, it asks the probes, the probe to launch a trust route um, to one of the prefix uh, which belongs to uh, the IP prefix that got hijacked. Uh, actually, we don't care about uh, which IP it is. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to, to, to be uh, uh, set up on a, on a box or because we are only interested about the path of the traffic. And so the probe um, does the, tra the trust route, and we get the, uh, the response. And here, what we try to do, to do actually, we do that manually because uh, it's quite hard to, to automate, but we try to match the IP addresses to the ASCs of um, the AS path, of the, uh, of the malicious uh, BGP update. And we do that by, for example, um, looking who is announcing the IPs that we get from the trust route. So, for example, um, the first two ops that are in blue, we are able to say that uh, they are in the first AS um, because uh, uh, we cannot say it for the first op because it's a local uh, network address, but we can do it for the second address. So, um, because the second address is announced by the blue AS, we can uh, match it. And we can do it for uh, uh, the, the third and the fourth uh, of point uh, also. So here, it's pretty cool because um, uh, I simplified a bit this, uh, this trust route so I can explain it. Uh, but uh, but uh, each, uh, it, uh, the, um, sorry, the results um, are the same. And what it shows here is that trust route timeout inside the red uh, AS. So we see that uh, the traffic is not going to Romania. And this is interesting because uh, we were not able to, uh, to, to know this kind of information before doing uh, active measurement. And in fact, when um, we, uh, we, we dig a bit on the internet, we find that uh, the AS that uh, where the traffic stops is actually a Russian operator, and this Russian operator is already known to um, to engage in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a malicious activities and uh, be, be for having previously already hijacked uh, prefixes. And so, what we are able to say with the trust route is that the last two ASCs are most certainly fake. So he is using a fake ASCs. Uh, in order to, I don't know, maybe hide its activities. But with the trust route, we were able to find that as the traffic is stopping here in Russia, it's most certainly uh, this AS which is originating the BGP attacks. So this is all for um, this is all we have done for uh, real-time uh, BGP hijack detection. Uh, it's still ongoing uh, work, so we are trying to automate quite a lot of uh, uh, what. Uh, I explained to you about uh, uh, manual analysis, etc. Um, we are trying to automate them uh, and, uh, and hopefully uh, 
we might be able to, uh, to detect uh, uh, the same kind of attack as Renesis, but we uh, have not seen this kind of attacks uh, during our experiment. Okay, I will let uh, Guillaume conclude. Some sweets for the questions. Um, so, to conclude, um, we managed, I guess, to show you that uh, we can do wide scale BGP hijack uh, automatic detection. Indeed, a uh, key message to, to get is that there is only a few hijacks targeting at least France and Japan, and for what we know, there is few hijacks targeting France. So, Nicolas managed to, to show you and prove you that it's possible to do early detection and reporting, and indeed, we are working closely with French operators in order to improve the reporting and, uh, and the classification. So some takeaway messages from, to you, some <coughs> five, four stuff you need to remind. So today, packets can be redirected on the internet. So as a consequence, your traffic must be at least auto authenticated and encrypted. So if you are an operator, if you know some other operator, you need to push them to monitor their prefixes, and you need to push them to be ready to take some actions, for example, for example by sending uh, more uh, specific prefixes. And networking is a bit like um, coding in security. Uh, we have best current practices, and indeed, uh, networking best current practices they must be enforced. So that's the, the conclusion of, of this talk. So if you have question, we can give you Japanese KitKat, green tea, and a sweet potato. We have a lot of them, so I guess <laughs> you can have a lot of questions. Thank you. slash 22 prefix on Monday, and it was our autonomous system. But uh, the tool managed to detect it, even though we are like in a sleep, a sleep in Japan. Uh, the threshold is almost the same, so it stopped at, uh, like here, at uh, autonomous system uh, 444050, the Ocean 1. But the thing is, may, it will maybe a presentation later, maybe for stick or something like that. Uh, because we are, uh, we are looking at the traffic, we know that we receive a, a lot of SYN hack messages from uh, uh, 25, uh, the port 25, which is SMTP. So we know for sure that these guys were sending spams using our IP addresses. And also good stuff we knew, we, we know that uh, they are using all of our IP addresses, which are close to uh, 1,000 IP addresses. So it's really good for us indeed, because we are, we are able to observe their, their behavior. Thank you for the question. So what do you want? Green tea or sweet potato? Okay. Um, hi, I have a question as well. So, is your research public or um, can we access your um, information? And second question is, uh, can we also, um, do, you, do you provide your tools open source so we can use them, for example, if you want to do our own research? Mm -hmm. So, no and no. So, <laughs> re some results are public, so, so the autonomous system name is Observatory of the Internet in France. So that's a project we started three years ago, and the goal of this observatory is to work with French operators in order to improve our view and our understanding of the Internet. And the report by design is anonymous. And something we are trying to push, we are trying to, to push the same uh, kind of observatory in, uh, in Europe by talking with uh, other countries. So it's indeed public to some extent, and the tools they are not yet uh, released. Or we have not not all so for example, you can uh, download the BGP parser and use it. And we are uh, thinking of releasing this tool, which is trying to do the BGP uh, road simulation. That's all, to, that's all you need to have to detect the BGP hijacks. And actually, um, the, um, the BGP data are public also. So you can do the same computation as we have done. So indeed, yeah, releasing the tool, that's not our main priority. Our main priority is to the report to operators and understand what is going on. But yeah, thank you for the question. You can take whatever you want. We have more food if you are. 
Uh, hi. Okay, uh, so 20 years ago, uh, Merge presented at the US Senate committee that BGB hijacks were possible, like 20 years ago. So what are they doing now to secure the, to replace BGB? Are they doing something? Because the, the hijacks have been known for like 20 years. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's a good question. The thing is, depending on where the operators are located, um, the, it was the example of, between France and Japan. So for example, in Europe, <coughs> Uh, it's really difficult or impossible to launch an hijack because your upstream provider, the autonomous uh, transit provider, will apply filters. And in other parts of the world, it's not the same. So, for example, in Russia. And if you want to fight uh, BGP hijack from Russia, we need to go to the upstream provider of this Russian operator. And so it will take time. So, so far, there's no, no real automatic system which is available everywhere. You can use root objects. A new stuff is called RPKI. It's using a crypto to put signatures on a product object. So indeed, there's some improvements, but only on the best current practices part. It's kind of good in Europe, in, uh, in, uh, in the US, not the same in Asia and uh, in other countries. But good question, you can have food. Uh, hi, I would like only to ask two clarification. The first is, uh, when you show uh, the map of the entire world, uh, you see that uh, you um, Say you said that a uh, user can't verify that the traffic is hijacked, but uh, my I was wondering why if you if you do a, a, a trace routing a tracer a simple tracer can't you pinpoint that something is going is going wrong? Oh. Okay, indeed this one. So the thing we are trying to do. So that is what the IC bot is saying. So, okay, I detecting an hijack, and this is IC, the autonomous system pass. Which means that routers locating this autonomous system they are what we call infected. So if you want to, to reach an IP address, they will likely be routed to the wrong destination. Yes. This so is by the using problem. a trace route, we are launching trace route from a probe in this autonomous system. That's a way to check if what we learn on BGP will be done in the routing plane. That's routing plane. That's a routing activity. That's a like a networking term. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's indeed the, the probes gave us the abi uh, ability to do the trace probe. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Thank you for a very good presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, the first funny question is uh, what's the channel name of your IRC bot? <laughs> <laughs> the other question. question is uh, about the trace route from there. Uh, you know that you can spoof trace route, trace route. So have you seen this kind of spoofing in order in order to disguise the MAS, which is being used. If you, yeah, uh, the question is, uh, you can modify the trust route uh, by, uh, I don't know, but it was uh, uh, shown by the guys from uh, Capitalism Philosoph, I think, at DEF CON in 2008. Uh, it's possible to modify the trust route, but we don't know uh, if it's modified. Uh, there are some uh, things that we can look at. For example, um, if you have an increase in the RTT, or uh, some things like that. We, we, we can still find uh, interesting information, but no, we, we don't know. We, we, don't, we have not looked at this kind of information. We started that in, in, I guess, in August or July, the automatic detection. So I guess it would be like we're going from big data to small data with my yeah. offline stuff. We have a lot of information, IP addresses, entities, and we need to look at that. But of course, yeah, we might find some kind of uh, IP spoofing. Okay, so thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is about the way um, legitimate A, um, AS can claim an IP range, because you said that one way is to change the prefix, but the attacker can do that too, so I wonder how you can react because it can be like ping for me. Ah, you mean the 2 slash 24? So at some point you lose. <laughs> the thing is, for example, OVH, because they are so big and really well interconnected. So, if you remember a really simple example with AS42 connected to one operator, OVH is so big that it's so well connected that when they send the slash 24 prefix, they always win. But if you are a small operator, in some cases you will lose. For example, us, we could lose to this game. And if you are losing on the BGP plane, you need to go and see a stream provider and ask them to filter. So it takes a lot of time. That's why in the conclusion I say, okay, 
be prepared to react. It's not only on the GDP plane, but also your guys, engineers, they need to fight and chat and uh, give phone calls and so on. It, it takes time. If you are small, it could be painful. So you mean that size does matter? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we still have more food. Any more questions?